So, having called the uh, motion, the uh, meeting to order, I need a motion to confirm the agenda. Christine and Gord, please. All right. Um, that the agenda for the Community Development Commission meeting of February 10th be confirmed. All in favor? Carried. Um, so, no, item number three is disclosure of pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof. Anyone have any pecuniary interests? Seeing none, moving on to announcements. And I understand we have a couple. Do we start? Uh, yep. Ms. Lavender. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. I just wanted to announce that the Prince Edward County Chamber of Commerce will be hosting two days of workshops on March 4th and 5th um, to help our businesses grow. Okay. March 4th and 5th, did I say that already? Yep. They will be at the Armory in 2M, 206 Main Street. There are seven different workshops over two days. Um, health and safety in the workplace, mental health in the workplace, uh, uh, governance for not-for-profits, which is important for Todd and I probably to connect on. <laughs> um, now I feel like I'm being quizzed. Uh, <laughs> branding and planning. Um, a financial workshop, social media and the law, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> One last quick question. Uh, who can attend those workshops? Prince Edward County Community, Belleville, Quinney West, anybody and everybody. You just have to register online. Registration will open later this week. <laughs> it's going to be $10 per workshop, uh, $30 a day if you come for all four on each day. There are seven workshops, but one of them is a two-parter, the governance one, so there's eight. Um, so it's $30 a day or $10 per workshop. And if you book five people from one business, you get the sixth one free. We're all about promotions. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. Uh, we have another announcement from uh, the acting director, Todd Davis. Uh, to the chair, it's my pleasure. Uh, a press release went out this, this morning, uh, but it's my pleasure to announce uh, to the Community and Economic Development Commission uh, that uh, uh, our department was uh, recognized with four awards uh, through the Economic Developers Council of Ontario. Uh, the County Wayfinding Signage Program won the Planning and Strategic Development Award. Uh, successful Careers video series that we launched last year uh, received the Workforce Development and Resident Attraction Award. Uh, the Community Economic Development Award was uh, provided to us for our support given to the County Food Hub project. And uh, Rebecca Lamb, uh, a Destination Marketing and Development Coordinator from our department, was uh, honored as the Young Influencer of the Year. Uh, so my congratulations to the members of the department that were uh, worked on that work, and I uh, just wanted to bring it to your attention. Awesome. Thank you, Todd, and congratulations. And uh, thank you, uh, the... Um, I saw the city TV clips went through, and I, I got a chance to look at those. They looked looked good, and I, it looked like you know, useful for a lot of folks. So, good work there too. Thank you. Although I can't take credit, I didn't do any of the work. <laughs> you will pass that along, I'm sure, to your folks. Any other announcements? Seeing none. Moving on to the minutes of the. Last meeting, I need a mover and a second, or Janice. Oh, I have a change. Two minutes. Okay, let's put Should, them on the table. Yeah, on Can the we put them on the table? Do you, do you mind seconding it? And then, and then making them we'll put. Okay, sure. Okay. Uh, that the Community and Economic Development Commission minutes from the meeting held on January 20th, 2020 be adopted as presented. And you have a comment, question? Yeah. 
Yeah. Looking at my notes to myself. <laughs> um, I noticed that, um, totally minor, but since I'm nitpicking things, Sir was not up capitalized on Sir or Madam for the Rocks letter. Um, and I also note that uh, Prince Edward County Chamber of Commerce is indeed the Prince Edward County Chamber of Commerce, not tourism and anymore. We've had our name changed to drop tourism. Um, and these are in the minutes, yeah. Um, I can't remember why I circled this. So I will skip it, but I circled it. Thank you. Is that su su sufficient direction? We can <laughs> offer that and without a motion or amending or anything? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, I would ask that the motion just say that the minutes be approved as amended. Is everybody in favor of that? Okay, all in favor? Carried. Number six is action items list. I need a mover and a seconder to put it on the table. Faye and Jeremiah, arbitrarily. Sorry. Um, do you want to talk to him? There is uh, no action items list attached to this week's uh, agenda package. As far as I know, uh, the sole item on that, uh, on that list was uh, related to uh, data capture related to the wine industry, but every other item had been accomplished uh, as of last meeting, so. So we don't need a motion just to do nothing? I don't think we, yeah, I would agree. You don't need a motion to do nothing. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Moving on to deputations. Um, we don't have any deputations listed. Uh, the next item is comments from the audience, and I see we have some guests from the audience, uh, in the audience. If, if you have comments you'd like to make on today's agenda. Well, I just hope here to answer some questions. I think we've got, uh, we were working on a, a fishing tournament for the Bay of Quinney here, and it should be available for questions. Terrific, and well, welcome. Um, number nine. Items for consideration, 9.1, report of the Community Development Department dated February 10th, 2020 regarding partnership with Bay of Quitty Walleye Tournament. So here we are. So I need a mover and a second to put up, Jamie and Faye to put up, and so it's on the table, on the floor. Questions and comments? I do have a question. Jamie. Give me a second, so I just want to get to the <laughs> Do you want Mike on for or anything? Sure. Uh, well, it's nice to see this is about time. Uh, we know the tournament has been very popular here for years and this collects a huge amount of fishermen. I think 5,000 some years, which is, you know, it's astronomical with the amount of people coming in here the first week of May. So I, I'm glad to see this. But Scott, just this one thing uh, right here, they talk about the new uh, fish donkey makes it possible to eliminate need for centralized starts and weigh-ins. Could you just explain that to me? Yeah, so really, I'll try to keep it short. I'm known for being long-winded, but uh, I have been approached many, many times over the years to help or different organizations start fundraiser tournaments. Obviously, with the, the success of Kiwanis, other people have tried to do it. Um, the fall, if you're unfamiliar with the Bay of Quinney and the fishery that we have here, there's really two distinct fisheries. There is a resident fishery, which for the most part are juvenile fish, one to five years old or one to four years old, that stay in the Bay of Quinney system year-round. Then there are what the Bay of Quinney is literally world renowned for. And I think we, we included a couple quotes in a presentation we did with K Karen. But there are multiple examples of the Bay of Quinney and specifically really Picton being the hub of that being a top three walleye fishery in the world, no, no questions asked. Um, so it really is a very special fishery that doesn't get as much attention as it deserves, which is the fall fishery. Those are those migratory fish. They migrate out into the lake uh, after they spawn in late April. They spend the entire summer out in the lake and they come back in, usually starting September, a little bit after Labor Day, they start to come in. They don't peak until a little bit later. But that fall fishery is where we are literally world renowned 
Uh, we do the charters, obviously. We have guests coming from all over North America um, every fall to fish here, and they, they just rave about it. The challenge with a tournament at the that time frame is you're dealing with fish that are mature. They are, for the most part, like 12 to 13 years, up to like 25 years old. So they, they are, we really need to protect that resource. And every time somebody has approached me about doing a tournament, I think, A, it is, it is, uh, suicide for a company to put their name on something that is either a catch and kill tournament but even a catch and release tournament where you retain those fish in a live well all day so you catch it in the morning or you catch them deep you bring them in and you release them you know presumably at at a way station here in Picton and they're they were caught in 120 feet of water way out you know in Adolphus Reach and they're brought in here and released in 15 feet of water it's actually very detrimental to the health of fish and you'll, you'll end up killing them is whether you want to or not even if you think you're releasing them you're gonna hurt them so the challenge has always been how do you have a tournament format that that protects that, that fishery that doesn't have that weigh-in format. So what we've decided actually to build our own app, we're, gonna, we're just commissioned to get it done, hopefully have it ready. The backup is to use this Fish Donkey app. Um, what that is, is a, a catch, it's called Catch Record Release, or CRR. You're seeing many big tournaments, if you're familiar with bass tournaments. Uh, why am I drawing a blank Major on League Fishing. Yeah, Major League Fishing is one of the first to move towards a Catch Record Release. The AIM Walleye Series is Catch Record Release. The B1 Series is moving towards that. It's really a whole shift in the industry. Of The whole concept is to catch a fish, record that fish, enter it, and immediately release it. So lots of benefits. You're not displacing those fish. You're not taking those big trophy fish from where they have naturally been in their environment, releasing them somewhere completely different from where they want to be or where they're migrating from. Um, the other thing is you're immediately releasing them so you're not keeping them uh, barrel trauma, which is catching it deep, bringing it up to the surface. You're immediately releasing them so they can repressurize, get back to their environment. So it's much, much better for the fishery. And that's what the whole premise of this tournament series is is an app on your phone where you will catch the fish you're actually going to take a picture of it uh, and immediately release the fish thank you any other questions oh leslie in Les sorry but the competitor inside of me questions i think it's all amazing but as i read it i thought it was great um but then you're putting that fish back in the water for the guy in the boat next to you to catch him Catch and release is, is very uh, accepted in the fishing industry now. I mean, even in general, uh, the tournaments are all catch and release. There really is very, very few to any. No, not at all. Um, that, the, the, the whole fishing industry is catch and release now. Uh, in, in terms of, I mean, we get people frequently, a charter is around $1,000 a day. Uh, they will come up, fish two or three days, and never keep a fish release every single fish they catch. Uh, it's, it, the whole catch and release uh, concept has really taken off. Um, so it's, it's very accepted in the industry. It won't be any problems at all. The only potential challenge we will have is moving to length as the method of winning versus weight. Um, that's gonna be the only potential challenge, but you're seeing it more and more, and every regulation is length. Nobody says you, you can keep a fish that's four pounds, you have to release a fish that's five. All regulations are based on you can keep a fish that's 24 inches, you have to release a fish that's 24 and a half inches. Um, that's not the actual regulation, but um, as an example. So I, I, again, that's the industry is shifting towards that because it's a much easier metric to control. You don't have calibration of scales, et cetera, et cetera. Calibration of a, of a, of a ruler is easier. And quite honestly, the, the competitor is return on investment, is how much is this gonna cost me and what is my potential winnings? That's what's going to drive, and that's what's really exciting about this model. Um, because the overhead is lower, uh, you can start and stop whenever you want. Um, I think the buy-in is going to be really big. Uh, it'll be interesting to see exactly how big, but you know, uh, you mentioned Kiwanis having at their prime 5,000 people fishing a two-day tournament. We are looking at doing four weeks in May and then four weeks again in November. So shoulder seasons in terms of filling accommodations, um, shoulder seasons in terms of all of our business is here um, and it's eight weeks of competition for a low investment we're talking about ten dollars a day twenty dollars for one week and fifty dollars for the whole tournament 
potential payouts if we get 2,500 people fishing it. Uh, first place is for every week, we're gonna pay out top five. Um, I think it's around 3,000, paying down to about 1,000. And then the overall winners would be 4,000 down to uh, 1,100 or 1,200. So you could have, you can spend $10 and potentially win $7,000. So in terms of the competitor, the, the uh, investment is low, the return is huge. Jeremiah? Um, thank you for sharing this. I think it's great to see uh, the opportunity, as you articulate, about the shoulder season and uh, recognizing that we have a world-class fishery. It's exciting to see a, a destination marketing opportunity unfold from this because uh, far too often we've been very focused on a couple of our core assets, so building uh, a larger platform to message off can only enhance the, uh, the consumer experience for people visiting and then a great place to fish is a great place to live. I should say we've, we've sent out um, to just kind of partners in, in the industry with one email that we sent out we've received nothing but a lot of excitement from the industry. So Rapala Canada has put their name behind it, they are the title sponsor. So it's called the Rapala Quinty Gold Series, gold for the color of the fish. Um, often it's called Quinty Gold is the, is the walleye. So Rapala has put their name behind it, uh, Evan Root or BRP. Uh, is involved, Kingfisher Boats, uh, actually from out west, is, is involved, and uh, Bay Marine is another gold sponsor. So really, without, with one email, almost all of our sponsorship spots are full. Uh, we just wanted, I think it's very important for the municipality to put their stamp of approval on it, um, to put their name behind it, really identify it as something that's, that's Pictons or Prince Edward County, so that, that this is coming out of here. Um, and I, you know, I think it's important uh, that, that uh, we have your support. Or um, <clears throat> thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I spoke with these gentlemen earlier. My, my concern is the fact that being a boater and, and having my boat docked at the Prince Edward Yacht Club, uh, my major concern is uh, uh, the boaters going in and out and controlling their speed uh, because we've experienced this uh, on, on other occasions, especially the first of May when they have their their uh, fishing tournament and they rip roar in through there and you got millions of dollars worth of boats banging and crashing against the dock. So um, I'll have the gentleman explain how Fish Donkey uh, uh, helps, <coughs> helps with that. Plus my question would be, um, can you think of any other measures where we can caution the boaters uh, coming in out of the bay? I, I think one of the major advantages when we were looking at, at tournaments, um, the constraints of running a traditional tournament in Prince Edward County or out of Picton is parking space, boat launch space, public access. It's very limited to, to a traditional tournament. You just couldn't support it, quite honestly. Um, the advantage of this platform and using a mobile app is there is no way in. There is no additional boat traffic necessarily on that specific day, on that time. So your boaters can leave from wherever they choose to launch, whether it's Deserano, Trenton, uh, Picton, McFarland, wherever they choose to launch uh, is up to them. There's no racing in to weigh in a live fish before it dies and get it back out. Um, it's, it's weigh it, release it out there, so that boat traffic coming in and out is completely eliminated that that concern is just is really not there and there's no parking or boat launch because it's a month long you can fish whatever time you'd like not everybody trying to get their boat in the water for 6 a.m on the 21st you you launch when you want you fish when you want you log your fish when you want and and that's it bill uh, no um my question's been answered i was wondering how fish donkey weighed the fish just technically, so it doesn't. It uses length, yeah. Okay. And it, it's it's an you. easier metric yeah. to compare and share. And I don't, I don't think we'll have an issue with it. Um, I think it's going to go over well. Again, the, right now, sustainability, uh, you know, minimizing our imprint on the environment is, is very 
forefront of everybody. So I don't think we're going to have a challenge. You know, 15 years ago, I don't think the environment was right for, for something like this, but I, I think we are there now. Yeah, sounds like a great idea. If I can just add, the, the B1 series is a, is a big bass tournament that is a two-day event that's run out of Belleville. Um, it's a very big, successful event. However, the, the municipality of Belleville there gives $20,000 to run that event on the July long weekend. So they, they obviously feel the return or the value to that. We're talking about a, a $1,500 investment and it really is, it's almost more um, just for the sake of putting a stamp on it. It really isn't about the money. Quite honestly, we don't need the money to run it. Uh, it's not gonna make or break the tournament at all. But I just, uh, we felt that it was important to partner with, with the municipality, um, for the municipality to have their stamp on it as, as a host here. Um, so for what it's worth, that's uh, why we're here. Councilor Maynard. Thank you. Thanks for your, for your presentation. And yes, I guess the fish is out of the bag, so to say, as to, uh, <laughs> as our, uh, to, to attract uh, people here to, uh, to compete for our, for our pickerel. But uh, that being said, just on the, one of the, um, on the proposed mitigations, and it says funding model for the tournament caps, the level of prizes once a reserve has been established. It is stated intention of the organization to channel additional earnings towards charitable donations in the community. Could you yeah, so what, what, again, I've been approached many, many times um, to, to run tournaments. I've always said no. What was kind of the final shove this past spring was a friend of ours, actually a closer friend to David's who's involved with Rotary. And they came to us for advice on trying to do something. And so we just, we talked to them and that's kind of what prompted it. So the, the idea, idea is, and I believe that once once we get to a return of about, if we can get 2,500 people, which should be very easy, I really anticipate us even achieving that in year one, but years moving forward, I, in the spring especially, I, I can easily see eight to 10,000 people participating in this. And what we've looked at is, if you're looking at an initial investment of 10, 20, or, or $50, the return at the levels of 2,500 people is a large enough incentive for people to buy in um, and be able to use the the funds additional beyond that to to go into a rotary or other local charitable um, organizations is what we plan on doing i do think it's important that there's a management fee we will not take that management fee but i think it's important to write it into the budget because for the sustainability of a model if we get tired of doing it and want to hand it off to somebody there needs to be some incentive for somebody. Too many, uh, too many models don't have a management fee and, and they die. Um, so I think it's important to build that in. Um, I also think that it's our plan is to not put any money into charities until there's enough money set aside to run the next year. So there'll always be reserves for the next year to be fully covered. Um, and again, I just think it's too many charities end up running themselves in the negative or too close to zero to be a sustainable model. Um, so that is the, the long answer to what you're saying. Just as a, a follow-up on, on a different topic, so we're, you know, the, some of this might be to staff too, but the, to promote uh, staying in the county, but I mean there's all kinds of areas and in, in bays in off of, uh, off of the lake that offer, especially in the uh, early and the, the late season, <coughs> that offer some pretty uh, spectacular pickerel fishing as well. So how do we make sure that the... Um, that the outreach and the advertise and the promotion gets uh, spread to all areas of the the county that could that could benefit from it. Well, I think it's there's an aspect to a mobile platform which is is exceptional and unique to this method of running a tournament as well um, is wild card or lottery categories um, that really they can involve fishing but they don't have to involve fishing. Uh, so, for instance. The example that we have and have pitched to, to State PEC um, is essentially a, a, a voucher to somebody um, that wins that category. And the way that you enter that category is to take a picture of, of your accommodation receipt for having stayed in Prince Edward County and you're automatically uh, put into this category to win that. So now you've said to somebody that's coming to fish the tournament, well, if I choose to stay in Prince Edward County, all I have to do is submit that receipt and I have the opportunity to just win another $500. So why wouldn't I do that? And at the end of it, all we do is click a button on the back end and it spins all the people in that category and gives them, here's the winner of that category. Um, so there's lots of opportunity that can be expanded to restaurants, upload a restaurant receipt, 
Um, you know, it, it can go many sorts of ways uh, in that fashion. And, and then on the website, that's the other reason we kind of feel important to partner with Prince Edward County um, is to have a host location and show some of the information for where accommodations are, where to eat, where to stay, all, all of that stuff right on the page. Okay, yeah, I, I'm supportive. Just make sure you find a way of getting a, a launch fee out of all the people that are launching their boats. The well, that was something, so we, we raced to Karen um, because from our understanding, the county actually can't enforce launch fees at the launches because a bylaw doesn't exist for that. Um, to ticket them. To ticket yeah. them. Um, so we, we kind of asked for validation in that, but that is our understanding. So we do feel it's important for the county to pursue an appropriate bylaw. Go ahead, Tom. <laughs> uh, through the chair. You had to know I was going back. <laughs> oh, no, that's fine. I expect it. Um, uh, and just for these gentlemen's information, uh, there will be a report coming forward to council in, on February 20th with relationship to marinas and boat, uh, somewhat dealing with boat launches, but it will contemplate a bylaw uh, related to fines for not paying your boat launch fees. So uh, it will be addressed hopefully in, fe in February, March, so it will be uh, in place well in advance of this tournament happening. I'm sure you've heard it, but it is well known in the boating world that it's not enforced. So there is very little incentive from that perspective. It would be great to enforce it. Yeah. Councillor Forrester. Well, I just want to thank you guys for finally bringing this up. And, you know, there's been a lot of discussion around this table for years about, I guess, missing opportunity. You know, when you talk about five, 8,000 people coming in with a lot of disposable income. As within the winter time, we have snowmobiles enough, people who come in with a lot of money and are bringing in the off-season business, which we need to promote. You know, I look at our little lake, East Lake, West Lake gets a lot more business, phenomenal bass lake. And for the last two weeks of June, well, when bass season opens, I have 16 cottages basically booked just with fishermen. After that, it disappears. But for those two weeks, it's nothing but bass fishermen and walleye, but mainly the bass. So there's lots of opportunities here, early May, June, and into November and December, as we've seen here. So keep pushing this, and I think we can make some money here off some of our county assets that we haven't in the past. Um, thanks, guys. And I just wanted to congratulate on a very well-written and comprehensive report. I'm shocked that we've talked so long because I thought it was a really good report. I really liked the uh, risks and all of the considerations that were put into the report this time versus previous reports that we've had when there's been requests. Um, so I really liked the presentation of the pros and cons and that. So I wanted to give my compliments and I wanted to make a motion that the CEDC contribute 1500 to form a partnership with the Bay of Queenie Walleye Tournament. I think it's on the table. It's on the table. Yeah, 5%. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna, I, I've got my own question before we Absolutely. lose. Uh, Scott and David, and thank you. Okay, That's, do you wanna go first, Mayor Ferguson? <laughs> okay. I, I, I think it's great too, and congratulations on your work and, and, all, the, uh, and all the rest of that. My, my curiosity now, you've, you've piqued my curiosity in terms of this uh, notion that uh, we're renowned as uh, not being not uh, enforcing any fines. Do you have any? Uh, do you know of models that work better than others? Do you know of? Uh, I mean, simply scale is important, right? So simply putting more people out to put little tickets on probably is not our best solution. So do you have models that you can point us to? <laughs> I really truthfully don't. I just know that, I mean, I buy an annual pass every year um, and I just buy it at the beginning of the year and I have it. I do know when you talk to people uh, and I'm sure you know it from opening the box. It, it, nobody's <laughs> putting it in there and they all know they will tell each other at the ramp, don't bother doing that, nobody gives you a ticket. Uh, 
so I, I mean that's the only reason why I bring it up because it they they share that when they're launching and you just have to go to those key times in May November when the, the ramp especially here is loaded I mean there is potential revenue there that is that is being lost uh, oh, for enough. sure. So, uh, but when you go elsewhere, yeah. is there a, like a fish parking? I app? think it's just ticketing. No, I mean, most of them are automated, right? Like you go yeah. to Belleville, George Street, or, or those those are just an, similar to Main Street. You just have a, a pass that you put on the dash. And I mean, again, no different than somebody walking down Main Street and ticketing if it's not there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's all I can think of. I really don't okay. have a better solution. I just think it's important to bring yeah. up okay. that it is being shared, that it's not to bother doing that. I know that the request has come in from CJ as well to to run that, and I don't know if that would be part of that as well, but I'm sure if it was privately run, he would certainly have a vested interest in, in that ticketing, and I don't know where that's going, and I don't want to open that yeah. discussion. No, I trust we will consult yeah. widely when the time comes. I was just, yeah. you were here, and I wanted to, yeah. I was curious. Sorry, Mayor Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just got <clears throat> my days of fishing or generally in the rear view mirror. Um, you say we're, we are globally recognized as for the autumn fishery? Absolutely, yeah. I have I had examples in what I presented to Karen and I'd love to do it. I mean, just do a quick Google search of Bay of Quinney walleye fishing and see what pops up. But I had examples in the last three years. Um, I wish I had them in front of me. Uh, in Fisherman, which is North America's probably largest uh, fishing publication, said, uh, I, I said, if you want to fish over 10 pounds, there's about uh, a walleye over 10 pounds, there's five or so places in North America to go, or, or more yeah. than that, to, to pursue that. But if you want to fish over 15 pounds, the list drops to three Lake okay. Tobin, um, <clears throat> Columbia River, and Bay of Quinney. Yeah. So, so there's so it's reasonably well known out there. Substantially more than reasonably well known. And another, I used a clip, I filmed several shows with Bob Azumi over the years here. Um, Bob Azumi is somebody who, I mean, you've probably all heard the name, he's been in the fishing industry for you know 40 plus years. He has had the opportunity to be invited to and fish anywhere he wants in the world, has fished every trophy fishery in the world really. And his personal best walleye comes casting right off of the, the water treatment plant. Um, so Bob Azumi's best, no biggest please. walleye of his life is from right, literally right there. Um, okay. You know, and he talks about that in the show that I filmed with him. And I have that clip that I showed Karen where Bob Azumi says that. You know, so I think that in and of itself speaks volumes to the fishery we have here. And Picton is the epicenter of that fall fishery. You know, when you talk about uh, encouraging people to stay here, it's very simple when it comes to that, the fall side of it, like November. Picton is the epicenter. It is the best place to launch with shelter in the harbor. It's the best places to stay. Um, it, it's literally the epicenter. There will be no difficulty at all encouraging people to stay in Prince Edward County in November. The May is where the fishery is a little more spread out. But again, th those lottery divisions are really exciting where you can enter and it's really just a raffle to win a prize. And we can push people to stay in certain areas or eat different places. It's one of the, the great parts about a mobile platform like like that. Okay, just just one quick follow up. So, is the event traditionally marketed through the sportsman shows, the Toronto sportsman shows coming up next month? There, there's one in Quinty. Um, you know, how do you go about? Yeah, I, so I'm interested in attracting. We. Uh, again, one of the, the big benefits to partnering with Rapala is having their reach of social media. The, because this is, is mobile based, it really is, it, we can advertise it on social media. These are the, the market we're looking to get into. Rapala has just over half a million people on their Facebook, and I didn't look at their Instagram, I should have. Um, the marketing manager was over the moon excited about this concept and about putting their name behind a tournament of this format. It's really the first big one that's going to happen in Canada. Um, he was the marketing manager for Rapala Canada was over the moon. Uh, he, he couldn't wait to put their name behind it. He's 
really excited about it. So when they blast it out alone, there's going to be half a million people that are fishermen that will see it. We have taken a booth at the Quinney Fishing Show or the Quinney RV Show and Sportsman Show. So we do have a booth there. Um, we'll work on that. And then it's really social media is going to be where, where it is to push this. And I think it'll grow. We've done a couple of videos. One is going to be a 30 second video, a really short, exciting video, you know, just, uh, it's just going to be flashing words, you know, that says, uh, it's coming a new age in tournament fishing. Um, and we're it, keeping it to 30 seconds. So it's very easy to send and share and that will make its way around fast. Um, so I don't anticipate having a big trouble. The other exciting thing about this model is you can piggyback it with all the other events. So something like Kiwanis, which has, uh, you know, at their prime was 5,000. I'm not sure what they're down to now, but you can fish both tournaments. There's absolutely no reason why you can't do this tournament, take a picture of your fish and then take it in and weigh it in the Kiwanis tournament. Um, so again, if you're already out there on the water uh, and you're already fishing for an extra 10 bucks, you have the chance of winning $7,000 if you catch a fish. It's, it's going to be very easy easy to talk or to get people excited about jumping on board and, and fishing it. I really genuinely am. Uh, it is, it's a really cool concept. Uh, I, for years I've told people it is suicide to put your name behind a tournament in the fall on those trophy fish and this has really enables the ability to not only do it but do it and, and gain notoriety and, and um, you know good publicity. And we have had um, one of the Contributors is it was it Ontario Outer Doors? Yeah, Ontario yeah. Doors. Tim. So Tim Ontario Outer Doors is already uh, looking at running an article on this. It was going to be the May yeah, issue, but it's going to be pushed a little bit later, I think, than that. So, Christine, um, I just have a comment. I agree with all of my colleagues that you know it checks off all the boxes. It's really more of a comment for staff um, in the. Uh, under the risks you were talking about, this is one of the an ideal example of you know uh, somebody coming for financial support, um, and you're, there is an option there that's saying you know what what are the op uh, likelihood of other events coming, shoulder season, the kind of boxes that you've checked off are really important, and so um, you actually put two um, two options in there. You know we can evaluate it on a case by case or promote shoulder season visits or initiatives such as this in some of the other sectors, the arts, the culinary, et cetera. And I would just like to say that I think we really need to, based on this ideal kind of scenario, set up some sort of a framework that says, look, we need to move on the framework side as opposed to a case by case. And that way then people will know ahead of time if they're gonna come and look for something that, yet yeah, these are the boxes you've gotta meet before we'll even consider financial support for anything. That was just my, my comment and suggestion and congratulations. This is a very good, very, very well written report. Council Forrester. God, just interesting here in my glass that for years the Qantas Club has taken the credit for putting on one of the a world class tournament and it's being based out of Trenton basically. All that has gone to that area there. Even when the fish were caught in Prince Edward County waters, they didn't always say that. And a lot of years they were caught, right? Within, within our borders of our, our fishery. So I think as we move this forward, that we get on board and we become the epic center for this project because it is world class and it can bring in a ton of money and it will be good for everybody in the shoulder season. So again, great work. Thank you guys. Thank you. So I'm, I suspect we're just about out of questions and comments, so I'm <laughs> thinking we might be ready for a vote. All in favor? And that's carried. 9.2 is a report on public transit marketing red application. I need a mover and a seconder to put it on the floor, please. Leslie and Jamie. Let's see if you would read it, please. Um, that CDC receive report CDD 09-2020 for information and that it, it approved the spending of 2020 CED funds up to $10,000 to assist in public transit rollout marketing and promotion and that the CEDC requests staff to apply for red funding to further assist in public transit rollout marketing and promotion. Now, Trevor's going to... 
talk yeah, to us a little bit about chair. this? Uh, so as you may have already been aware, public transit rollout is happening this spring. Um, at the same time, there's an opportunity for RED funding uh, to apply for it. RED stands for Rural Economic Development Funding, administered through OMAFRA. Um, this budget for the commission this year includes a line item uh, called red funding. So we have 20,000 allocated in there. What we're proposing as staff is to allocate 10,000 of that to go towards the public transit marketing to help aid in that. Uh, the red funding is matched, so we put in 10, they give us 10. That means we have an additional 20,000 to put on top of the current uh, provincially funded marketing dollars for public transit, which is $46,000. So that means, sorry? 46 over the life of the program, which is three years. So uh, the, if, we, uh, if you approve this today and we are successful in getting that funding, um, then that will increase the marketing budget to $66,000. That said, it's spread over three years, so one of the big challenges with public transit is awareness and getting the public to even know that it exists and that it's available. And staff really feels that this needs to be topped up in order to give it due justice. And um, you never want a scenario where the end of it, it wasn't successful because people didn't know about it. So that's uh, what, our, what we're recommending. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Lord Fox, please. Right. Uh, thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair. So I'm confused on this because the thing is, do we have a transit system? And because it seems to me that what you're doing is we're going to spend $46,000 to tell people that we have a transit service system that we don't have. I, I don't understand. the. Explain to me what marketing this means. What are we selling? Who wants to? Uh, through the chair. So uh, just to be clear, we have currently uh, uh, a specialized transit system that's been offered for a number of years for people of a certain age or accessibility issues um, that is supported through gas tax revenues. And we have, uh, we have in the past had transit services provided, excuse me, um, through uh, the services of Deseronto Transit, the municipality paid them a, a nominal fee every year and they and gave them the authority to pick up and drop off passengers within Prince Edward County. Uh, but that was never a formalized or a, a formal um, community transit service. It, in 2017 or 20, early 2018, we brought forward a consult, uh, we put together a plan for transit that was uh, endorsed by Council of the Day, and, uh, and we made an application to the province for the community transit services, or they call it the, T, the CT grant, or the community transit grant, um, that we were the successful winner, uh, we were successfully granted $500,000 to establish a community transit service in Prince Edward County. Change of government meant that, that those funds didn't actually come forward in a uh, transfer payment agreement until late 2019. Those funds uh, actually started to flow through to the municipality in the very end of the year and we went out to market and are in the process of procuring the services in effort to establish a basic transit service for Prince Edward County. I believe um, the county foundation, who is our partner in this whole program, uh, presented some uh, information around transit to a previous uh, Community Economic Development Commission meeting. Uh, and uh, we will be bringing forward to council. Uh, the, we've gone out to the, for the procurement process and we're, we're prepared to bring forward at a, the next actual meeting of council uh, that the results of that procurement process and have council award contracts for, for the delivery of uh, fixed route uh, community transit. 
the goal would be to bring transit from Wellington to Picton up 62 into Belleville to get people like students, seniors, and uh, commuters to and from Prince Edward County to help with develop, move, either moving students to places like Loyalist College, helping seniors uh, that maybe need to get out of the community to go to a health care appointment or something along those lines. And as Trevor so ably describes in the report related to people from workforce in Belleville being able to get into Prince Edward County to work at some of the jobs where we have opportunities but no staff to fill them. Hopefully that answers your question. Yes, thank you very much because it brings it back because we yeah. had that big meeting in Wellington so yeah. it's, it's nice to see that we're actually moving forward on it. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Christine. Um, my question in a lot of the other reports, um, you, uh, the past few reports, you've done a little bit of a risk analysis, and mm -hmm. it's missing here. Um, and um, because the marketing is trying to, you know, you're monitoring ridership, that's the real key thing. And I think at the last meeting when, when, when uh, the foundation presented this, mm -hmm. we had quite a robust discussion about the risks of getting ridership up, like it's a cultural shift all of a sudden using this new service. So I was wondering if, if that was just inadvertently missed, but you know, how, how are we going to monitor that ridership and, and how are we going to mitigate that risk? Acting Director. Uh, through the Chair, so th this, uh, we didn't include um, a risk category because this is simply a, a request from, I mean, there are funds available for marketing transit uh, through the granting program and through uh, the municipal budget. Um, this is a request to make an application for a grant. So w if we are successful or unsuccessful, we're still going to be marketing transit. We will have a greater conversation about improving ridership, uh, those types of things. It's less, uh, it was less about the risks, there's uh, less about the risks to transit. This is more of a request to uh, the commission for support to apply for a grant. I mean, the reality is we have a finite amount of money that we can market those fun the market those services. Um, if we could add an extra ten thousand dollars, that isn't ratepayer money to help with that marketing effort. That's a benefit. I don't see any risk to, or it's it's less of a risk to us if we don't get those funds simply because we are unsuccessful in the grant process. So, I don't know. Hopefully, that answers what you're looking for. Yes, thank you. Anyone else? I guess the only uh, the only thing I would ask is uh, the tricky bit is that the red is a window. The red application is a window, so the funding opportunity opens and then it closes. Uh, I, I'd personally feel better if we had the business case of the uh, marketing launch is going to cost X, and we can make this kind of contribution. We're, we're, it feels like we're throwing a little bit of a dart on a wall here, um, so. I, 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 I guess I'm comfortable with the um, with the ten, um, but there is, a, and I guess I'll put this to the to the to the rest of the folks on the commission. But there is an opportunity to potentially make that greater in case the need was greater. But we, with absent a, a business case, I, I guess I'm. So I just want to put that on the table for the folks to think about. Yes, please. I mean, I could speak to that. Uh, so certainly, we sort of, as we're just getting ready to bring this process forward in terms of development of a marketing plan, understanding what the costs are going to be, um, we would like to make this application based around $10,000. If when we do the plan and we realize that there isn't the funds, maybe we don't get the funds from Red, although we feel relatively confident that we're going to make a strong case for those dollars. Uh, but say we were unsuccessful and there was a greater need to help with the marketing of the service going forward uh, in effort to bo boost ridership or grow this uh, program so that it's sustainable to a certain degree um, at the end of this, at the end of the piloting program, uh, we would come back and I, I, I think we would come back uh, to, to the commission with A, the marketing plan when it's done, how we're going to go about uh, rolling out this program, how we're going to market it, how we're going to encourage ridership uh, for a myriad of different reasons. To, um, but then I would also suggest that if there was a greater need, we could come back at that time and ask. Okay. Anything else? 
Okay, it's on the floor. All in favor? And that's carried. We've gone to 9.3. The regarding the 2020 priority review. And um, remind me later, we'll put, I haven't put this on the table, but I understand Trevor is going to uh, give us a presentation here. So yeah, uh, through the chair, thank you. What I hope to do, um, if you recall from the last commission meeting, we discussed quite at length uh, a number of different topics related to the, the motion that's on the floor regarding council priority number five. So um, what I hope to do is uh, provide some background and rationale as to the recommendations that are in this report. Um, the report highlights three different categories uh, with each one having its own objectives that would then go to council for approval. Um, so I'll spend about 20 minutes doing that and then I hope to facilitate a discussion uh, around feedback from yourselves as to what needs to be amended with it, uh, suggested changes, maybe we need to remove some things and make other things more of a priority. Maybe there's a chance to kind of consolidate some areas as well. Um, so that's the goal in terms of today. Uh, and if I can make one honest suggestion, if we could keep the conversation geared towards uh, actually making suggestions on amendments uh, and suggested changes, uh, as opposed to just kind of opinion or what you think about something, that will help push the conversation along. So I, I hope that makes sense. Um, the other thing, just governance-wise, is at the end of the presentation, we have a Schedule A with basically some blank bullets, and we'll be just doing it in real time, typing out what those amendments are, and we'll pass that as one entire approved package today, as opposed to having to go back to staff and rewrite it and have approval at the next meeting in March. So, any questions at this point? Is this good? Okay, great. So I just want to take a step back a little bit and if you recall from when the commission did its own priority review back in last summer at Huff Estates, um, just a refresher that establishing the priorities uh, really drives the objectives in terms of what we hope to accomplish as a commission during our term here. And then those objectives really drive the activities that staff undertake or you know, what, what things we recommend to council. And then out of those activities, we drive KPIs, key performance measurements. And I know Christine has always been an advocate of making sure we have those measurements there uh, and in order to gauge success and to know whether we're actually making a difference. And th the commission has really taken a lead on that in the past, even before your term. We had project-based indicators and then economic, broad economic indicators as well. So we hope to continue in that vein as part of this discussion. I excuse the large amount of text, but I just grabbed this from uh, our terms of reference as just a refresher. I know there's been a lot of talk about, you know, maybe there's a project we can sink our teeth into, or maybe we can be more of a, a working commission. Um, it's important to remember that the commission's really is to set strategic priorities based on public consultation, industry feedback, uh, and also to provide uh, recommendations to council on those strategic plans, and also to annually review our own priorities. We established them last year, but I think in March we'll take a look at that and see if there is anything that needs to be updated with, the, with our own CEDC priorities. So what we have before us today is the council priority or objective number five, a stable and diversified economy. Uh, that to me, the word diversified or even stable can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And I think for the sake of the discussion today, uh, we need clarity and we need to be direct in what we mean, especially when we're setting objectives. It's like, what do we really mean and what do we really want? And it can't really be left for interpretation. So um, let's dissect this a little bit. And I think when 
some people say they want diversity. What they really mean is that they want they they want to see either less tourism or not tourism. They want to see other sectors of the economy uh, grow and thrive, uh, rightly or wrongly. So we've seen this in many different discussions. Uh, there's a growing animosity towards tourism from residents of the community who don't feel that it brings any benefit to our community. Uh, they perceive that the county continues to market the region uh, with no consideration towards the negative impacts uh, that tourism has on the community. Um, and so we've seen this in the, the council priority as well, where we have the uh, balance the needs of tourism industry with the needs of residents, or to mitigate the impacts of tourism on residents and infrastructure. So these are real discussions that we need to have uh, in order to flesh out what does the commission's position on this, and when we make that position, let's stand firm on it and go in that direction um, and not not, uh, what's the word? Gasoline. Sorry? Gasoline. Yeah. So this is further, uh, you can see this in the vital signs report that was put out in 2018. Our population has boosted the, the popularity has boosted the economy. However, it's having an impact on local life. Housing prices have soared, roads, infrastructure, and services are feeling the strain. Sometimes visitors' expectations are out of sync with the county reality. And also some people feel that they've been, been left behind by that change. So with all that said, as the analogy goes, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, the economy is more than just tourism. Uh, the tourism sector is actually intricately linked with other sectors of the economy. When we look at agriculture, agritourism, uh, manufacturing, uh, a number of different areas. So we need to consider the positive effects that, the, that it has had on the area uh, and, the, and the investment attraction that it's brought as well and, the, uh, and what it's done to the area over the last 20 years. Uh, I think we can say that we've all been very successful at leveraging the, the county brand. So just to take some look at the numbers, uh, from 2014 to 16, uh, the county grew from uh, 2,600 businesses to over 3,000. Uh, many of them are self-employed entrepreneurs, uh, and they are obviously not necessarily in the tourism market. Uh, we currently have 80, over 8,700 jobs in Prince Edward County. That's up by 700 since 2011. So that's over an 8% increase uh, and when you compare those numbers to our neighbors, Hastings and Northumberland, they only saw 1.4% and 0.4% and 0.4% respectively. So there's this element of, you know, we need to celebrate our success as well. We are somewhat the envy of other areas in Eastern Ontario and Western Ontario as they look to us to see how, how we've done it. But it, it certainly isn't without its challenges. Uh, we can say maybe this, this is something that, you know, earlier, maybe 15 years ago, the question was how can we grow our economy? Uh, where now today the question is how can we grow the right kind of economy that, that benefits everyone? So some of those challenges, again, we've talked about this before. We talked about it at length at the last meeting. Uh, attainable housing is getting out of reach for many in the lower and middle class even. There's a growing disparity between the lower and upper class, also known as a, a shrinking middle class. Uh, the vital signs report uh, says 10% of households suffer from food insecurity. That's as many as 2,000 people. And also last week, if you're aware, um, actually some students from the Learning Center had done a presentation about food insecurity as well. And that's something that um, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to in a little bit. Uh, we have an aging population, a lack of younger workforce. Uh, we have growing health care needs in our community. And actually, 2035 is when this is expected to get its worst in terms of the demands on our system, uh, the lack of young people entering into this market, uh, and especially being a retirement destination, it's especially problematic. The strain on our infrastructure, and combined with the fact that there really isn't a long-term solution or, or plan in place 
to, to address some of these. Uh, we have development pressure in our communities um, that potentially threatens the, the fabric of our communities as well. Uh, I think we all don't want to see suburbia uh, turn into to our communities. Workforce uh, has been an ongoing issue. Uh, we have some councillors that say we need full-time jobs. And then we listen to the businesses and they say we can't find anyone to fill our jobs. So there's that dichotomy that's at place where um, sometimes we need to dissect the, the, the issue a little bit more to understand what's going on, what's really going on in our community from the, from the businesses and, and the residents as well. Uh, in March, uh, we hope to have a presentation by Brad from the Center for Workforce Development. Uh, there's some new studies out that speak to the participation rate in the labor force in Prince Edward County. So there'll be a chance to look into this a little bit more. Um, the, the Chamber of Commerce as well is taking the lead on uh, doing a, a project they've applied for funding for attracting and engaging and evolving workforce. You were? Oh, that's amazing. So that's great. So the Chamber was the lead with the County Workforce Partnership, which out of that outsprung the HEAT program that's helping a lot of people that we've talked about, the, the people who are, just need that leg up in the training to get to market or to get into the workforce. And this is another excellent example uh, of that happening. So it's great that the Chamber is taking the lead on that. And again, related to workforce, our department is undertaking a BR&E this year in the tourism sector, uh, and that's starting actually within the next few weeks. So what we have before us is council objective number five, a stable and diversified economy, with uh, continue to grow and diversify our economy into areas where we have a competitive advantage and unused capacity. Uh, and the measurables are uh, something that we will determine soon. But before we get into the recommendations, there's this concept that, that um, I'd really like you to consider that's a little bit outside the box in terms of uh, what we've been asked to do as a commission. So the, the current structure right now is that the council's priorities are helping drive and inform the commission's priorities, the work that we did last year. But there's an opportunity where we can ask the question as a commission that says, what objectives can the CDC recommend to council that require the support of council to meet those objectives successfully? So I think in the past, there's been often times where we've made a priority, some big, big community issues that can't necessarily be effectively com accomplished just with this commission alone. That it might need the cooperation of council, it might need a number of other things, such as cooperation from other departments, maybe it needs capital budgets, maybe it needs advocacy, um, where, and we've seen examples of this in the past where the commission has been quite successful in doing that. If this wasn't on your term, but two years ago, um, the commission recommended support of The Rock with some programming to help young entrepreneurs. That eventually went to council with the recognition that it needed something longer term in terms of the operation of the youth center. And that was a success story that the commission can be proud of to say it, it started with the commission, it was piloted here, and it eventually became something that changed the community longer term. We have a report that went to council that was um, really an outcome of the commission's work with the development framework process, where we had recommendations on making a smoother process for developers with the planning department. And now there's a report that is called Better Development Approval Processes and Better Outcomes Initiative that's, that's underway with council and staff. The visitor services pilot, again, is another example and the county wayfinding strategy, both of those things originated with the commission. So within that vein, I think it's something to think about how we can start to think about future examples where the commission can play a leading role in identifying those key concerns and 
Maybe it's striking a working group in those areas, or maybe it's simply recommending to council to take a look at certain things that are, that are over and above what this group is capable of. Some of those things that come to mind is the downtown revitalization. There was a lot of community hours and business owners and residents that put time and effort into the development of a downtown revitalization strategy and action plan. Uh, currently, it has very little staffing and no capital budget allocation besides what we receive from the province. Um, like I said with the commission, with the KPIs, the, the key performance indicators, that could be something that the, the commission recommends the council to take a look at adopting as a way of measuring the successes of, of the corporation as a whole. Uh, I mentioned uh, I'd come back to the learning center with the food security discussion that they talked about. That might be something that this commission takes on as well uh, to say, you know what, this is the proper body uh, to be tackling those issues and to be looking into the root causes of, of food security and, and poverty in general. So I know that I've thrown a lot at you. Uh, in the report, like I said, the recommendations for the uh, objectives are broken down into the following categories. Resident and investment attraction, workforce development, and sustainable tourism management. This is what you have before you for the first category. And I won't, I won't read all of them, but what I'd like to do is open the floor for discussion related to resident and investment attraction. And I'll just jump to here. You can see I have some amendments uh, that are open and I'll, I'll type them out in real time and we can have a discussion. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, that's okay. We can always take it back as staff and then bring it to the March meeting with more of a fleshed out um, recommendations based off your feedback. So I'm happy to open the floor, Mr. Chair. So who wants to jump in? Well, while folks are pouring over their notes, I'll jump in quickly okay. with, um, I, I like, I like number one, I liked all the bullet points. I thought yeah, something about new Canadians, expand the outreach to new Canadians seems, seemed like it belonged in here. Okay. I know you talk about it later, but it seems like it belongs in here too. So that's just a suggestion. And again, as, uh, while people are mulling things over, can I just go back to some of the, some of your premise? Yes. Just a couple of small points. Just, this is where it's. Do you want uh, to? Not, not advantageous, it's actually not a good thing to actually see how the sausage is made, but it's okay. Um, I, 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 I challenge some of the points in the premise. I, I don't know if there's growing animosity. I know there's, in terms of tourism, I, I you know, there's, there, it's maybe getting louder, but I don't sense any real, in fact, if anything, I'm gonna, in, in governing, er, just from my 17 years here, I, I find people understand it. There are the tension points, but I, 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 I just wanna be careful with, and I would worry about language like that, leaking out into the world, but, uh, okay. and some of the, and again, the growth challenges, and again, I know, like I said, this is just nuance, but some of the growth, some of the items you had listed under growth challenge, I'm not sure are attributable to growth. There's certainly demand. We're not meeting the demand, mm -hmm. and those are creating challenges, and you've rightly described those, but putting those simply to growth and saying we, uh, um, and that takes me to my last little point here mm -hmm. on, the, on the premise, which is right kind of growth. I don't know what that means. I don't know if there's, I don't know that there are buttons on our economy that we can twist and turn that, that do that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. those are just okay. my comments. And now I'll turn it over to Fox, Court Fox. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I agree with the Chair in one respect that tourism, 
Tourism has been in this county for the last hundred years. It's not new. And the thing is that, you know, I can only speak for myself, but, you know, being a county boy, then in the summertime, I don't go downtown, you know? And mm -hmm. when I want to go to Belleville, I don't use Main Street, you know? You find ways to get around these bottlenecks, if you want to call them that, you know? So, so that's, 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 that's kind of the first thing. And then this whole business of, see, we've been very, very successful at selling ourselves. And the problem is we weren't prepared for it or it's overwhelming us because we asked people to come and by golly, they came. And what are we gonna do with them? And so we're, we're now, I think in some respects going Oh my God, all these people are here. So you know, how do we accommodate them? What do they do? You know, those kinds of things. And then of course, uh, uh, we have the problem with, with a lot of people coming in here and, and some people probably want to blame it on tourism, but it, it comes down to the, uh, to, to the STAs. And, and, and it's nice that, that, that we kind of have that in a way because it accommodates all those people that come here. But the offset of that is that it's ruining our communities. You know, in my opinion, I think it's ruining our communities because we, we have the, you know, the, the dark houses. And, you know, I mean, not all of our older folks go to Florida and leave their house empty. You know, I mean, even on Hill Street, there, there's an abundance of STAs. And there's nobody in them right now. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's, it's those kinds of things that we're reacting to things that happen because of. So right. that's what I have to say right now. So through the chair, or Rick, just to address your point, I've, I've jumped to prior, uh, category area number three related to tourism because um, what I'm hearing is there might be some appetite to uh, adjust the language so that it's not so much let's try to deal with tourism, but we, we maybe we should embrace tourism, support support it, but then also have other ways of m mitigating it. If that's does that make sense and, at all? Or? Fair enough. And I, I sorry, and I I don't mean to unravel or turn this up. I, I apologize no, if, okay. I, if I've done that, and and I don't mind going back to number one. <laughs> You're right. All my notes are on number three, and right. we'll come to that whenever yeah. you want to talk about number three. Uh, but uh, but uh, no, I, I I guess mm. sorry, I was premature, and I don't want to unravel your process either. No, that's either. fine. That's fine. I, uh, to your point, though, number three does have. You know, it talks about revenating, revenue generating opportunities for tourism, mitigating tourism, restricting the unfettered growth. You know, that the tone is very much, res, res, yeah, punitive or restrictive. And I've got lots of notes. I've got lots right. of notes. Well, number fire three. Fire away. Okay. Um, I apologize. I'm just going to jump in and hope, uh, but the first bullet point: explore revenue generating opportunities. Uh, uh, that has to be. Income generating, at the very least. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yes. With, with a conversation jump, so yes. <laughs> Apologies. So uh, the first point, bullet point is explore income generating. I personally would like to see prudent income generating, but it can't be revenue generating. We can't just do revenue. We can't collect revenue without making sure that there's a return of some sort. Can we? I, I, that's a question. Yep. I seen that just as a, I mean, these are still pretty high arching uh, recommendations. And so, I, yes, we're going to try and find revenue generating opportunities where, wherever we can. Boat launch, I mean, the conversation on boat launches is a perfect example, uh, you know, Yes, we are going to have a municipal accommodations tax. Where else can we, you know, can we, uh, as a community, um, generate revenue so that we spread the benefits of uh, of what of the uh, of the change in our economy? Okay, I just have to. I, sorry, I feel like I've got a, the uh, so. In my <laughs> but it's it it can't. Oh. How do I put this? 
I, I don't think that can be open-ended. What if it costs? Mm -hmm. What if it ends up costing a ridiculous amount of money to look at? Then we may have to make some point, make a decision at some point that, you know what, maybe maybe the, the our, our docs aren't uh, informed. Maybe that just isn't enforceable. But I mean, just saying explore revenue generating is too open-ended to me. Rick, my argue to that it would not be generating revenue if it was costing us more to implement. So that would take it, that would just naturally take it off the list right away. It's not a revenue generator if it's... We generate revenue without making money. We generate revenue without making money. But anyway, sorry. I, wow. This seems like the wrong way to have this debate. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> so if I can make still, a suggestion... I would say that one should stay. That this letter A, exploring revenue generating opportunities while also not negatively impacting the tourism industry or it's a balance it's a balancing act for sure yeah, it's also in section three on the sustainable destination development um, I mean what I think would be very valuable would be to look at other communities in Ontario that have gone through what we're starting to go through. I've talked actually to some people from Niagara on the Lake and the uh, skiing area. And I mean, there is a, I think, a, a fact that's there that we can start with, and that is that we're attractive because of community and it's the country and there's old places and so on. That brings in more people to come here to start businesses, which then threatens those things that are cherished by the community. And that's just this cycle. Recognizing that, what some communities have done is first <coughs> to recognize it, to say that is the case. It's some sort of inevitable cycle. And within that, within that framework, think of what, what you can do to maintain both sides of that system. So I was talking to a real estate agent, for instance, from who had lived in Niagara-on-the-Lake and saw some of the changes there. And interestingly enough, just one example, I said, you know, well, a big issue in the county is, is SDAs, uh, you know, B&Bs being an example. And she said, well, probably you're not going to have to worry about that. She said, within five or six years of a whole bunch of B&Bs were setting up in Niagara-on-the-Lake, a third of them two-thirds of them disappeared. I know lots of retired people who have this image of some ideal life where they have a b and B. I I mean, as far as I can tell, you're just a slave. <laughs> and after they do it for a while, they give it up. So it's just sort of one example. Like, I would never have known that. So I would think that gathering data from these communities on what they did, what worked, what didn't, would be a tremendously good start on this. So we're not, we're not we're not pioneers in this. I'd like to see us learn what we could. And I think some of these destinations are very similar to ours in terms of what draws people there. Niagara-on-the-Lake, for instance, close to a lot of huge populations. Uh, similarly here. Um, so I would really propose that that kind of uh, data gathering be done. I will say I think it would be hugely helpful. To that, Thank you. To, for data collection in that, in the tourism industry to compare ourselves with other uh, similar uh, areas. That's part B, creating a sustainable tourism development strategy. Uh, the tourism strategy is something that we've never quite honestly ha had, <laughs> period. Uh, we've had some high level, just like, uh, there's never, never been a comprehensive document that can be something we can reference in terms of decisions. And a tourism strategy would do just that. It would do data collection, it would look at other areas, and it would start to address some of these needs in a practical way. Uh, that's something that our department is undertaking this year. Acting Director, did you have, did you want to say? Uh, so the, no, I was just going to agree with Trevor that, that uh, in response to Bill's comments that uh, probably the best way to understand what other communities have done uh, 
before us is to do some research uh, and develop some strategies that are going to help uh, with tourism growth in our community and how we may manage that. And uh, uh, just to reinforce what Trevor said, that is a, a on the work plan for uh, 2020 in our department. Uh, we were able to receive some grant funding that will allow for us to do that type of work um, and certainly is probably the most responsive piece to uh, the original priority number five, which was uh, around sustainable uh, sustainable destination development. So, uh, the whole goal is to is to look at how the state of tourism today, how we might grow into the shoulder seasons, support that industry so it becomes year round, but also understand how that sector impacts the needs of residents uh, and and also uh, what it, what it requires for support and how we might support that industry. Fair enough. Thank you. Uh, I I'm going to go back and just uh, around, but I just want to make sure we're serving Trevor here and his need for going through this wording. I, I apologize because I, I started the little bit of unraveling here so and wandering off. So, uh, so I apologize for that, but I just want to make sure we eventually come back to uh, help Trevor with, uh, with his uh, task at hand. Jeremiah first. So if the task at hand is to look at the words and we're hearing uh, restrict unfettered growth as punitive and we're learning that a strategy is in place or being formed, would we look to language that would say create the strategy that will inform the sector with balancing the needs and wants of residents and visitors and just remove this language that has a and to say that we're going to do a strategy that will inform the needs. There seems to be some nodding heads on that. Maybe not. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I guess my question is, uh, it might be silly, but why do we think that we're going to be able to manage this? And why do we want to manage it? Because we're not the drivers. Because you can go back and talk about tourism, right? And one of the reasons the county is so popular is because tourists come here. And as tourists come here, then other entrepreneurs come in and say, I want to build a, a, a restaurant, or I want a B and B, or I want a, a, a county canteen. So it, it, it confuses me that, that for some reason, we're going to manage all this stuff and say, well, okay, fine, we're going to have this over here and that over there. And I don't think it works that way. I, I, I'm going to try and answer that quickly and just say there, there are plenty of examples where tourism went wrong, right? Lots of places where it went wrong and, and where if you could go back. If you run up all the way up and down the barrier islands, uh, we were just talking on the way in, down the U.S., there's a, there's a lot of places where tourism went wrong. And it would be, it's incumbent, I suppose, upon us to, to imagine the ways those can go wrong and try and divert those. I guess my concern is, is we take that sort of... Uh, base need and we turn it into thinking that it's sort of levers little levers we can pull it, it, it is it is it is not it is not, not that in my view but i i do get the understand i do get the the concern of many people that uh tourism to the exclusion of all else can go wrong uh through you mr chair i just don't want to lose jeremiah's thoughts and i want to make sure that we capture yes it so for point three under B, it would say create a sustainable destination development strategy that would inform and balance the tourism needs the tourism sector needs with the needs of residents. Yeah. Jeremiah, does it? Pardon me. Okay, um, Councilor Forrest. Yep. I, would add, uh, I think this is very good. I think we could take this back to council right now, the way it is then the work starts. Because then I'd like to see it come back to this group here and then start breaking down every one of these individually. And then from there, where the recommendations go. Like, you know, Gord, you said, how do we work on this? And I read one of the points here, uh, what do we want? 
uh, identify and eliminate unnecessary hurdles for de developers, businesses, and startups. Mm -hmm. Well, we can talk about that. We could talk about it for a whole meeting and start pointing out the issues, how this works in the community, at what point, how much development do we want? Do we want it here? Do we want it here? Do we cut it back? Just because it says here, make it easier, that doesn't necessarily mean the direction. It warrants more discussion, which has to go on. These are just bullet points for me to pass back to council, but I think the real work's to be done in the details, and then I guess who's going to do the work? And at some point, there's a lot of stuff here. <laughs> So I would almost suggest, yeah, we can hand this back right the way it is and start the next meeting. Let's start at two topics per meeting or, or three and start writing them down. And if there's an area in there that we really see that we need to work on, let's dive into it even deeper until we come up with a solution. Then we might say, Todd, Trevor, go away and work on this for two weeks or the next month and bring us back some solutions. And then you start forwarding them on to council and say, we, we have the time to dig into one of these bullet points here we have come up with some solutions and answers. This is the direction I think you should take on this. Because just passing this back right now, council's gonna read it and say, yeah, we agree, this is what we gotta do, but how do we do it, who's going to do it? Acting Director. Uh, just to respond to Councillor Forrester and to the Chair, uh, I don't disagree with you. I think that that's a good strategy. Uh, what I believe was gonna happen is once we've committed to what these look like under priority five. Uh, we're going to do some public consultation with the intention of bringing back the entire, uh, the entirety of all of the priorities to council for endorsement, to, for final endorsement once we've consulted with the public. I would also like to point out, and I think Trevor would point this out a little towards the end of the presentation, but uh, today we were given sort of two tasks from council uh, when they endorsed these priorities. Uh, one was to take uh, uh, priority number five, which was of all of the seven priorities that council had put forward, uh, this, this single one that was written sort of in the negative, the other six were written in the positive, and so we reimagined what the what five looked like because it was very restrictive around tourism and we wanted to open it up to the whole economy. It was the proposal that I made to council and for the commission to sort of look at what priority five was, and that's what we're doing today. But our commitment to you is we also have a, a process that we've been committed to that we will consult with the leadership team, the public, and council on the whole set of priorities. The goal is not to confuse this body today by bringing all seven priorities and getting feedback, but you, giving you a little peek as to what March is gonna look like. We're gonna have a, uh, hopefully a discussion um, around what the entire set of priorities are in them and the actions as uh, associated with those um, to feed into a report that's gonna go back to council at the end of Q1. Christine? Yeah, thank you. I, I think that's exactly right. And what, um, what, uh, in terms of the step, and what I would suggest though is let's get on the right foot with this, with these three. Um, you've said in your presentation, Trevor, thank that was that was really well done about the KPIs, and you know how much that how important that is, and it's going to be important for council to be able to understand what we need to measure to know what, whatever the strategies are that we're getting there, we're, we're 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 getting in the right direction. So I would start with these ones that we've been looking at. So um, you've started measurables and activities, and as I said at the last meeting, these are all activities. None of them are measurable right now. None of the seven that were in there. So um, my suggestion is to get us starting and thinking about outcomes as opposed to outputs. And so to start with this one, all you'd really need to do, I think, is say for the first, number one, instead of saying a process, continue to support resident and investment interaction, you know, by, um, you could just say the outcome is I don't know, robust resident or balanced resident and investment attraction. And you can, we can then, when we start to analyze this and do the uh, uh, action plans, we can figure out what does that mean? What is the indicator that we're going to measure to give us robust or balanced or whatever that adjective might be? It's qualitative. We want to put something quantitative to it. Same thing for number two. It could be appropriate work force development, looking at the skills that we need and you know that sort of thing. And then you've already got sustainable and destination development. So you've got an outcome and you've got something qualitative. And then when you start to drill down, you can start to look at, okay, how, how are all these activities going to help us measure that 
long-term outcome, because they are, in fact, going to be strategies in the end. So that's my only suggestion, I think. Um, and if agriculture is supposed to be in here, it doesn't really leap out that much, I think. Uh, I didn't see that tourism is in there for big time but, and business, but uh, that's my suggestion. I can uh, just, to, just to respond, so I, I just would like to ask uh, uh, Christine uh, a question, uh, which is maybe unusual because usually the questions come to me and I don't get to be the one that asks them. But I would uh, just as uh, so I, I agree with you that the three that we've identified, the three meta sort of level, uh, they aren't measurables. They are actions or activities. Uh, I think they were mislabeled in the general report from the consultant. And so we've been calling them measurables. But the reality is, is if you look at all seven priorities, there's priorities, objectives that council has endorsed. Uh, and then there underneath those are what they call measurable which we should be activities generally. Um, if we look at the three big ones that we put forward today, so uh, if we change, uh, continue to support and call balance resident and investment attraction and expansion, support, uh, what did you, something about workforce? Um, appropriate, appropriate or some sort of some sort of uh, better um, adjective around workforce development, yeah. sustainable destination development, it, and then you sort of Partially reference agriculture. Is there something else? So if agriculture is one, is there anything else that's sort of of that level that we should identify? I have, I have a suggestion f of an addition mm -hmm. to number three. Sorry, Which, just, to, yeah. just for clarity before we get there. Christine, are you suggesting that all of the sub-bullets that we that we hold off on doing them and just recommend to council doing those three. No, no, I think okay, they so need I'm them. okay. So they yeah, stay. No, I think they need the sub bullets. Those are activities. They're things that are important, right. okay. and they certainly came up in our last discussion. Okay. So council needs that. I think. Okay. I just think let's let's make sure we've got an outcome, a longer term outcome that's okay. the activities are going to contribute towards. Okay, and just to address the the topic of agriculture. Uh, it is in our commission priorities to support uh, agriculture, and we are working towards ways of identifying ways of supporting it. So, it most yes, it most certainly can be added into there. Um, there is one caution, though, in getting down to sector specific, supporting certain sectors over another, especially when you're starting to put it into priorities uh, and trying to meet certain objectives. Um, it does beg the question, why would you support one or the other? Or, or what is agriculture and what isn't? And we've heard a lot of, uh, and some councillors have said, well, we just want to support traditional agriculture. Well, there's also other kinds of agriculture as well. So it's a slippery slope when we start to talk about uh, sectors, even though we are talking about tourism <laughs> as a sector. So uh, just keep that in mind. Sorry, Rick. No, no. Um, one I, I, I thought was missing was, uh, and again, I, I largely agree with Councillor Forrester, but this is our communication to Council. This is, and, there, and uh, while I don't think we have to uh, get right down to the last word, I think some, some, some of the words are I'm uncomfortable with, personally, and uh, some are, and this one is just seems to be missing, uh, and that is uh, monitor and report on the success of STA regs. Uh, and recommend changes where needed. Uh, this is um, this I hear a lot in in my corner from folks who want to know where we are, how it's doing. Uh, I, I'm hearing a lot of what Bill is describing. A lot of uh, of um, folks getting out of the business. Um, so uh, so and. If the regs are not working in a certain area, I think it's incumbent upon us to monitor those and uh, and to adjust, uh, recommend changes if necessary. So, is there any particular suggestion on the word smithing that to include something else like monitor, report, and change as necessary, or or make amendments to STA as necessary? Just to uh, pardon. I don't think you can make a recommendation to make changes until you know. You right. just, I think, just stick, stay specific, 
and just monitor and report first, and then that can be addressed in a second. But I wouldn't say, okay. and we're going to change what we see wrong with it, because then I think you're just getting into the weeds. Okay. Oh, acting director. Uh, just to just to respond to both of your comments, uh, I don't disagree with uh, Faye. Uh, however, I, there will be a series of reports coming forward on the SCA program, uh, the licensing program. We will be bringing forward in short order uh, an initial look at what licensing has meant, how many, what the uptake is, uh, what the changes to the industry may have been. Um, that's a for information piece that's going to go to council and the public about sort of. Or end of the, you know sort of as we get into the beginning of the season what that looks like but we also have been requested there's a request on the floor from council uh, after uh, the meeting after we implemented the licensing program to come back one year calendar year after the program was input uh, with uh, that exact piece of monitoring and reporting to council what the outcome of the process and the program was after the first year and recommend if there's any changes and any sort of modifications that need to be made for streamlining or whatever purposes um, that's been already requested of us so I mean that exists on our work on our work plan uh, for 2020 um, uh, f for that very reason so and I, I guess I, I I understand that I just my I, there's just an existential angst in the community and this is our document communicating to council what we think they need to watch out for. So that's why I'm suggesting it belongs here. Well, and I don't disagree with you, uh, uh, Chair. I mean, uh, they, the council has already asked for that from us, so it probably and it doesn't exist in a priority anywhere. So it's probably appropriate for it to for us to monitor and report on STA regs as we've been requested to do so in Q4 of this year. We don't need to put a timeline on that priority, but I think it it could exist in, under the sustainable destination development piece. Thank you, Councilor Mayor. Sorry, we can go back to. So just to just to respond, uh, I think Trevor's numbering the number of amendments uh, instead of n uh, changing the meta document at the beginning. So we're currently dealing with number three, sustainable destination development, and we've encouraged to change p bullet point two to reflect the language. That, that would be an addition to, yeah, but we've already monitored, changed bullet point two to um, create a sustainable destination development strategy that will, you read that out, it was better, far better than me. That will, I didn't catch Thank that. Thank you. Sorry. Anything more on three? Sorry, inform and balance. Yep. So just on, on um, kind of along with what Christine was, was saying, and I, if we have another strategy without actionable items, I think we're all gonna <laughs> drown, drown in it. We, it's a, we've got a lot of strategies that seem to be ever-changing, but really very few actions that we can that we can monitor so I would prefer that we at least try and find and, and not worry so much about the overarching strategy I think that's kind of set by the by the uh, by this strategic plan by its nature so if we could maybe try and stay out of that we might uh, we might get to a little further um, <clears throat> I would okay and then so on number three um, Fostering shoulder season, I mean, I've got two check marks there. But so with the, so the measurable would be to create full-time employment because that was one of the, um, was, you know, the, you know, year-round full-time employment by having, because we've got a little bit of a dichotomy here. We've got a, you know, a strong leaning on a tourist economy that by its nature is part-time seasonal so how do we you know we need actions that can try and that can try and fill that out and I'll just say that maybe somewhere we could use the word staycation instead of attraction because I know that there is a lot of people and Gord you said it 
when uh, certain times a year or for a good part of the year if we've got uh, an extra weekend we're gone because we're not you know it's not uh, and that would blend itself into somehow making it resident friendly <laughs> resident friendly businesses or some way of encouraging people that's and that's problem. where the yeah well that comes to the fact that where that angst where that division is coming because when you can no longer go to your beaches when you can't get anywhere downtown where you're either you know where the where the restaurants are full you're going you know you've got a in-house population that's 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 leaving the county and so that doesn't promote a year-round full-time employment scenario I somehow we could put that in there somewhere yeah, please better uh, training so to response, response to the to respond to the chair I, I mean I think uh, if we look at at number three uh, sustainable destination development we've got four bullet points with the proposal for a fifth so under the under sustainable destination development we talk about exploring revenue generating or appropriate or or uh, some sort of maybe change around what a revenue is but uh, exploring revenue generating opportunities create a sustainable destination development strategy that will uh, so balance growth and uh, resident needs and I would argue that in that type of a document you're going to find staycation elements or how to engage residents fostering shoulder season product development and an asset development to support I think uh, is is um, uh, talking about growing that industry and the full-time equivalent jobs there providing comprehensive visitor services um, to improve the experience and better manage visitor traffic and I think the management piece is the important piece and then we have monitor and report on STA regulations which I think fit naturally under there um, I think that that's a wide ranging level of activities that might have happen under the action of sustainable destination development uh, what I would call for is is there anything else that needed to be added to three modified from three stricken from three well, I think three, two should be moved up to one because there's an ir irony here. Yeah. It, all the other ones are about more and more tourists, and then we got this issue with tourists. Okay. So we need to figure out what some sustainable development strategy for the tourism sector and what makes the county a special place, not just for those who've lived here a long while, but for anybody who might come here. Mm -hmm. Because really, it's a kind of ironic and a lot of these things, it's about more and more and more and more tourism. And I mean, you might say, look, one way to, to slow down the tourism is forget all this shoulder season stuff, which I'm totally in favor of the shoulder season <laughs> stuff, but that brings more tourists. Well, just to be and, clear. And if we start doing it, not just the shoulder season, but you know, the fall, the, the winter, the spring, we'll get even more. Just so, the, the so we can't have it like, <laughs> The, the, the first priority is to figure out how one might go about having a, quote, sustainable community that relies a huge amount on tourism. Trevor? Right. Um, in the absence of a sustainable tourism strategy, all of, a lot of these problems arise. Uh, so I agree that that maybe should be bumped up to number one because it'll inform and help direct all of the other issues. Yeah. Um, so I'm happy to make that change. Uh, the, the other part is support of the shoulder season isn't there by accident. Um, that is an outcome of our destination marketing subcommittee. Out of the, the many different things they could have chosen as a priority, that was the, the one single thing that they wanted to support. Um, because it does create full-time jobs. You look practically at the frontline staff, the hospitality sector, even wineries, for example. If their business model can sustain them through the shoulder season, then they can have full-time employees and they can keep them for the spring. So that's, that's very evident. That's not us guessing at that. Um, so I think that it's an appropriate strategy to, to retain in there. Acting Director, and then Bill. I think just to support what Trevor says too, I, I, department activity in tourism over the last two seasons has uh, 
done almost aside from the visitor services activities that we do in in terms of managing the visitors when they're here and providing them with the appropriate information we do no destination marketing activities for the summer we haven't done destination marketing activities for the summer season for the last two seasons um, simply because the, we are appreciative and understand um, that uh, we are getting our fair share or more visitors than necessary during those two sort of critical months of the year and have uh, really identified and done work around how we foster and grow the shoulder season pieces uh, in an effort to stretch out that season uh, from as early as possible uh, to as late as possible. Well, I'm not at all opposed to that. I voted in totally in favor, but I mean, it means more tourists. That's the bottom line. So, like, th that has to be realized. I mean, if somebody came here and said, oh, they're trying to keep down the number of tourists, and they saw that we're trying to, in in you know, increase the number of people that come fishing and stuff, they're going to say, well, what are you doing? It's a contradictory position. So I don't know that we're trying to reduce tourists. I think we're trying to make a balanced economy that is not so reliant on tourism, but I don't get that we want to reduce tourism. We want to manage it and balance it. Are the so I'm all in favor of that, but you know, unfettered tourism sounds like a negative term to me, and it means hold back on it. You know, so. Jeremiah? Yeah. Anyhow. Yeah. I just wanted to go back to the chair's first comments about A, since we're looking at language, exploring revenue generating opportunities. Were you trying to tease out like net revenue versus, because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in complete favor of being specific. You can't go chasing the dragon's tail when it's, you have to pump in a million dollars and your cost recovery of ROI is. 10 years out, that would be an unrealistic endeavor, even if it was a revenue generating. So language at saying, I'm looking through the chair, but like, where's the like greater net re or something that's a little more precise. Well, people understand income. I, that's why I used income. I, I, of course, I mean, yes, net income or, or and maybe even it's not even net. Uh, I mean, maybe there's, maybe there's some place in between. But just revenue I, I agree. is, is, if, is if not, not the right a, time. If it's not a lens overlay revenue against expenses yes. and we don't see a return on investment, this municipality is making very real decisions about where monies go into core services and infrastructure. So we need to always have that cost benefit. Just, I would just say that we, you know, sometimes any revenue is better than, than no revenue. And it's not very often that we make, you know, like. It, it doesn't matter really what we probably charge for our launches and docking fees, for example. They're never necessarily going to make a profit, but we'll, we'll lose less. So that's still, you know, you still want to generate revenue. Against that's expenses, though, there's got to No, you may not want to do a huge investment into something to get that revenue growth. But right, but it any always. Any revenue is. It always has to be measured against expenses, otherwise, it's not a, a business. Well, yeah, but you, you must remember that municipal governance of any type is not, we're not a business. We're not here to make well, money. Our we're budget here is to a business. Cover, we're, we're here to, uh, to try and cover our expenses and uh, mitigate the impact on the taxpayers as best we can. But we don't, we know that we're never going to, you know, that a lot of our, a lot of our services that we provide for the benefit of businesses and their, and our constituents will never really show a true profit. We can only try and make some revenue to offset the, the monies that we spend. So uh, I, I think yeah. we're, I just leave, I think it's, it's fine I the way I would it's, suggest, it's a general. I would suggest, however, the, the message from the, uh, from the, uh, econ or the development community is, uh, or so from the, from the folks in the, the marketplace to council is that you'd want to, um, you want to look at, you want to have a finer look at that. Anyway, sorry. This is just a comment about the language. I was going to jump in at a logical place, but I'm jumping in now, and that's fine, I guess. <laughs> um, my understanding, at least with this whole document, is that it's, it's about growth, right? And we keep using the word stable, and I don't think growth and stability 
I don't think they're synonymous. I don't think, like, under number three, we use it. In the title, we use it. Like, sustainable is a word I keep hearing, and it's maybe it's a personal opinion. Maybe it's a personal issue with that word, but is there, like, something else we can use? Maybe everyone else likes it. I don't know. I just thought I'd say that. <laughs> That's uh, a really good point, Sarah. It's... If, if we decide to grow the economy, we have to be firm in that decision and say, let's grow the economy. Let's, um, you can't have both sustainable and be growing it and be trying to focus on two different things. Uh, you could say sustainable growth. But um, yeah, I, I do agree. And um, the priority number five was something that was handed down to us from council, the verbiage stable and diversified economy. Um, if there is any appetite to change that, to be something different, then we could we could possibly entertain that. Mayor Fergus. Through you, Mr. Chair, I just want to um, couple of things, particularly concerning bullet number one. Um, last year, I think, was the first year that I heard uh, a lot of commentary about tourists and the effect of tourism on the, the county. And it wasn't that um, the business or local residents had anything against people coming in and freely spending their money. It was the, the uh, more to the fact that they were not necessarily paying their fair share in the toll they take on our, on our, uh, our infrastructure. So the, um, um, the concern Jeremiah raised about revenue and, and making sure that, um, you know, there's an evaluation of cost benefit as it relates to the particularly number one, the municipal accommodation tax, we are, we are um, looking seriously at introducing that, that uh, legislation here because all our surrounding um, neighboring uh, municipalities have started to do it um, and that's that's not just the reason to do it but the likelihood of it not um, exceeding a break-even point is extremely remote um, also to deal with some of the resident objections to to tourism um, We've started talking to uh, the um, the ministry about a park levy. That's going to be that's a long way off, but um, the road infrastructure that people are are um, consuming, if you like, when they travel to the county is something very top of mind for um, our residents. So those two items are are on the horizon. Just makes sense. The management of the boat launch and Councillor Forrester and Councillor Maynard and certainly I have had our <clears throat> frequent calls from constituents who want to know why the gold mine that we are um, ignoring at the boat launches, that, you know, tightening up those, those things will uh, also appease some of the concerns of the residents. So those things are all kind of underway and they're at various stages of, of development. But I don't think it's the, as I say, not the issue of the hordes of people who are coming in here. And the reasons for that, I think, are well beyond our control. As anybody who has a uh, camera and a Facebook or Instagram account um, can attest to those, the images of bucolic Prince Edward County and the lifestyle and the wineries and the food and everything else circulate all over the place and are one of the reasons we're as attractive as we are. But if we can, if we can meet the expectations of the public to get what they call our fair share out of, um, out of the hordes of tourism, I think that will do a lot to allay those, those, um, those fears. But I just wanted to bring that up as, uh, as a point that uh, I've been hearing and some of the progress that were and items that we're uh, contemplating in the future. Acting Director. Thank you, Mayor, for that. Uh uh, for those points, they're well taken, and I, I think uh, this um, 
Number three, whether we call sustainable or some other type of destination development, speak uh, to those those things. Uh, I would like to uh, draw to your attention to the time of the day, and we've had a robust discussion around item number three. Uh, perhaps we should uh, encourage uh, some discussion around one end or two. Uh, and if there's anything further uh, that you would like to see at the sort of top level, um, maybe that could come out as well so we can sort of complete this task in a Perfect. timely fashion. Fair. Yeah, I'm just going to go to number one. Um, so the, the point about identifying and working to meet local business needs such as infrastructure or technology, um, to me, this isn't really calling out where it's going to be coming from. If we can just make it a little bit more specific, perhaps, on saying, you know, identifying and working to meet local business needs using your strategy. You were talking about this tourism strategy or something. I just feel like it's quite vague. And then it says, such as infrastructure, technology. I'm wondering if we should just take those out because you're already just kind of creating the answer i'm not sure kind of just what i'm trying to say is this is quite vague but i think we can get a little bit more specific on it because right. it is important i think specifically that's referencing a lot of the br and e business retention and expansion studies we do where we go and interview the business owners so it, it could be reworded to uh that's what we're yeah yeah we could so you're saying just say it as that, like literally? Uh, yeah, I just want to see where we're getting some of this information and right. start compiling it yeah. rather than just making general statements. Like if that's where we're going to get that information, let's include right. it right. so that we know specifically where our information is going to be coming from. Okay. Just Thank for you, reference. Okay. Uh, to the chair, I'd like to draw your attention. H, uh, while I agree, has some importance, uh, perhaps A, at the top of the list, use findings from recent business and ex expansion and retention surveys to identify barriers to business expansion and retention. We could maybe, you may want to contemplate eliminating the last element of that sentence and say, using, use, using findings from recent business expansion surveys to, to stay, you could identify be and to, work. Yeah, yeah, you could combine business. H and A together, both of them shortened down, which shorten that list, and, and probably accomplish the same goal. That's, that's why they that, pay you the big bucks. Uh, don't, they don't pay me the big bucks. <laughs> I like that. I mean, it, it's jelly. Yeah. 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 Before we lose everyone, can I suggest we come back to Sarah's? Because I, it, yeah, I, I didn't actually realize uh, that we were still had stable and diversified economy. So while we have this brain power around the table, is there a better language that we can, or better overall priority, better way we can, or did you, sorry. Yeah, I'll speak to that. Yep. So you're, you're questioning a question around stable and diversified economy at the top level, priority number five. Well, yes. Uh, so the, the request from council as it relates to priority five specifically, uh, was to retain the priority name and the general objective, which is continue to grow and diversify the county's economy into areas where we have competitive advantage and untapped labor market potential. Right? Yeah. So for the purposes of this activity, the request is not to change those priorities. I think next month's meeting will give us an opportunity to provide feedback on what we think of them okay. in a holistic fashion. Okay. Does that make sense? Maybe not, but. Anyone else? We are at four o'clock. No, no, yeah, no. I, I realize. I mean, what's the what's the time frame to realistically get this back to council? Because do we take this home as homework and everybody does their uh, does writes down their ideas? Or are you expecting something concrete today? Because I don't think we're there personally. And I will just say that when we say that we're trying to make the best use of our that last little bit of your, your statement where the where we have untapped uh, potential well I don't know how we square that with the tourism right because that potential we know what that is what's untapped about that I 
I just think that we maybe need, if we all went home and wrote notes and questions and stuff, it might be more productive, which is probably what we should have done before we got here, but sorry. <laughs> we weren't sure what the process was, I guess. I feel like we need to arm Trevor with as much information and feedback right now so he can come back. Otherwise, he's just going to get a just a, snowed upon. Yeah. Okay, so I guess really what we're going to do, if I look at these, let's go back to the comments. Um, we've identified a priority five is stable and diversified economy, the objective uh, as is written out, and then the three bullet points, the major top line points are, um, Christine had proposed that one, in, eliminate continue to support and just call it balanced resident and investment attraction and expansion efforts. Two would be continue or appropriate workforce development or something along those lines. Uh, three would be sustainable destination development. So you're suggesting to approve just the the three areas. The three top line, the and if there's anything lines. else that then we can then take to the public to consult in the next meeting, we would have we will structure two reports to come back to you. What fits underneath those three pieces as sort of actions, and then an overall uh, facilitated discussion around all seven priorities and what the council commission's feedback would be on those seven to be included in a general report to go to council that wouldn't just be from the commission but would be from the community development department to include inputs from the commission, the leadership team, and the general public. Does that make, is that clear? Yeah. Okay. What happens to the work we've done the last hour? Is that intact? I think it's preserved and, and re-discussed in a, in a greater, in a conversation where perhaps we send you home with homework this week to look at those three items. So uh, we send you home with homework to look at those three items. Trevor makes some modifications to what was under those three and sends it out to you maybe in the next day or so. And we have a conversation about what fits under those three pieces under five. The question I have is, if we're looking at five as a general actions where balance resident investment, attraction and expansion, appropriate or some other word, increased workforce development, sustainable destination development. Is there something else that you would want to include at that level? I'm going to go to Jamie just in a second, but I, I, want to, I don't want to leave the wrong impression. I, I thought a lot of this work was, was really well done, and I thought it captured a lot of the discussion we'd, we'd had in the previous discussions. So I don't want to leave any impression that, uh, that we're, we're, we're uh, at least in, from my point of view, that we're pulling it apart because I, I don't see that need. I have some specific but, that I've talked about, but but I just want to be clear. I, I I went through these. I went and I I'm content with most of them. But anyway, yeah. one late point, Rick. Like you said, you're content with them. I'm looking at this. I'm okay with it. Yeah. But I have to ask you. You have to come up for a game plan with this. And you've obviously thought about what you're writing down here to present to this group so that we can send it back to council. They can say, OK. And then it goes back to you. And then you have a, a work plan on how you're going to proceed with this. How comfortable are you proceeding with this work plan or something new that this group would throw at, the, throw at you that might change? OK, that's interesting. But we did not even thought about that. So we've got to change our plans <laughs> about how we're going to do the work. Because I understand what has to happen here. And it all falls back. You have to put this plan out into, out into play. So I'm just looking for a straight answer on this. So. I committed to you, Jamie, that I would always give you a straight answer. Um, it's a weighty laundry list of items that have to be accomplished. I'm comfortable that our team can rise to the challenge and deliver on a number of these uh, things. Um, I would suggest that it we're not the only part of the corporation that is going to be tackling just, I mean, we will be doing the lion's share of what's under these priorities, absolutely, as a community development department. However, there are impacts on other parts of our organization that will, for example, 
Um, the identifying and eliminating unnecessary hurdles, which is under one uh, for developers business, uh, you know, would be ha will have some impact on some of our other departments. But I, I think the reality is, is what you've what we've presented to you today is doable. I mean, we're, we're talking about a couple of years to accomplish these. We're not trying to get these done by the end of 2020. Um, and we're nimble enough to probably take on some changes, uh, some minor modifications. I would suggest that I wouldn't want to throw out an entire one of these or reimagine what all exists underneath one of these three sort of pieces. Um, that would be my straight answer to you is you know, don't throw it all out and start again. Um, but um, you know, we're not sort of too far down the road in, in 2020 that we can't be nimble enough to change or modify what we're doing to some degree. Thanks, Todd, and I appreciate that. And I pretty much know the answer that you were going to give me. Well, what I'm just going to talk to is the group here, as you're thinking about changes, there's a lot of thought, the council priorities come down, the CAO, all the groups start talking about it, it's passed on to this group here, present it here, and then it goes, it sort of flows back and forth up and down the ladder. So as we change priorities, and this is, goes back to my initial discussion about what we do, how we do it, and accomplishing something. If you want to change the direction completely or tell Todd and Trevor that we don't like this, then it's going to, it changes a lot about what they've already thought about in the middle as it's playing around, if, if everybody understands what I'm saying here. Because this goes around, when we leave here for a whole month, they're talking about this back and forth, in and out, and then they come back and report it to us back and forth. So if you want to change that, that's what I'm saying, you can dib dibby-dabbly with all these things here, but they've got a game plan in here, how it comes back and how it's going to go to CAO. So as we add or change things, that changes their game plan. So it's just something to, to think about a little bit if you want to change it entirely or add a whole lot of things that they haven't thought about for the last couple months. Thank you, everyone. I think we're wanting to try and... Yeah, I, <laughs> I know Councillor Janice felt that it needs some work and it needs to go back to staff. I'd, I'd like to get a sense from everyone else around the table. I was just looking for us to have a chance to go, like there's, there's 21 bullets. Right. And that's a pretty aggressive work plan. I, and there's some in there and I, you know, we didn't go through every single bullet that I think maybe set up, like we want to have realistic expectations of what, where and target our efforts and have, you know, I, I think that we've, I mean, it's a, you know, we have this, this priority that maybe we should be looking at very many fewer bullets and actions, I mean, because, and not, and not setting up expectations that we, that we're not likely to fulfill. So instead of changing things, I just think that maybe some of these things are inherent in what we do anyways, but really we should focus our, try and focus our efforts. I, so to reiterate what you, you're saying, Councillor Janice, is that some work needs to be done to consolidate the list to make it simpler as it goes to council so that it can be easier to, to focus on those spe specific areas as opposed to having a whole laundry list of activities or objectives. That could be done, that could be done later too. Like, right. you take this, send it up, and then as it comes back, just, I, I sort of right. jump out of line, but just from a right. council standpoint, yeah. what Janice is saying, yes, it could so, be compacted, but it doesn't, I don't think it necessarily has to be compacted right now. Right. That's like, no, and I'm, we're not suggesting to do that right now, but one of the things is we, we could approve this today, knowing that it's going out for public consult as the next step. We'll get a sense from the community as to how they rank these and priorities, and then it could come back in March uh, with with that information and that will help inform the decision to distill it down wordsmith it further I think we're ready to do that okay yeah, I, think I just we're have ready. one point I know this sure. is coming in really late but the one with the developers business expansion startup I'm curious if we should tease them out because they seem to be very different like you want to identify but they'll all be very different I'm just wondering if you should break that down a bit just make it a little bit more digestible 
I could be. Which, I know I'm coming in real late on this about? one. Sorry. It's uh, identify and eliminate unnecessary hurdles for developers, business expansion, and startups. I just feel like those three industries are very different from each other, and the way you get there might be a little Gee, different as you. well. <laughs> Perhaps you, I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate that. I think that's coming from a municipal perspective, whether it's a developer or a business applying for a building permit. It's just like business is business. Sorry? Yes. Yes. Like at this stage, business is business. Okay. Okay. Are we uh, ready as a group to sort of let it go and see what happens when we, like the <laughs> butterfly goes? I just wanted to know about that one and Yes. Okay. So I need a mover and mover and a seconder, please. I know it's been a while, but Leslie and Jeremiah moved this to the floor to start the discussion about an hour and 20 minutes ago. <laughs> okay, all in favor then. Nine point four. Just to be clear, the only reason I kept questioning is because I do want it to move forward. So I was just being very particular to make sure it works. Uh, I just like to speak to nine point four before we. I don't think there's a motion on the f has to be passed with this. Uh, as a result of our presentation from the Rock last month, you asked us to author a letter in support of their grant application. And so we wanted to bring this back to close the loop. And to speak to uh, Leslie's point, sir was appropriately capitalized. In fact, I think, it, in fact, uh, um, yeah, it, it, was cap it was appropriately capitalized in the letter that went to the grant review committee. Uh, I don't think there's anything you have to uh, move on this item. I just wanted to bring it to you for your information. Through you, Mr. Chair. I mean, even though we don't need a motion or anything like that, uh, my concern is that budgets have already been set, right? And what we're saying now is that instead of 5,000, it's gonna be 15,000. Okay, am I wrong? Yes. Now the other thing is that <laughs> just, uh, just the other day, 100, 100 people who care gave them $10,000. So maybe now they only need $5,000. I'm just, uh, just as a response to through the chair to uh, uh, Commissioner Fox, the this is a letter of support. So yes, budget has been set. We do not have fifty thousand dollars in our budget to give to this organization. Yep. We 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 didn't a month ago, and we don't have it today. Um, what we've done is we've supported their application to the community grants program that is administered through the county foundation. So we set this, sent this as a letter of support with their grant application for $50,000 to a third party organization that is going to invigilate the community grant application saying, yes, we support this application. Depending upon what amount of money is in that program, yeah. how many applicants they get, how many asks they get, they may have to make some hard decisions. And so yeah. they're seeing from our body that we are supportive of this organization and their ask for 2020. Does okay. that make sense? Right. That's the clarification I needed. Perfect. <laughs> Sir? Uh, I support the letter and I think it's great, but Instead of starting with sir, madame, should we start with something that's gender neutral? Bingo. Very good. Uh, and through the chair to uh, Commissioner Johnson, uh, I point well taken. Uh, it, future letters will be appropriate. Okay. Next meeting is March 16th, 2020. And finally, I need a mover and a seconder to adjourn. <laughs> Faye and Christine. Perfect.
Faye, if you could read it, please. Uh, that this meeting now adjourned at 4.15. All in favor? Carried, and thank you very much. We made a number of amendments, so this part of the motion might have to say in this report because we don't want this exact report. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, quick chat. Right, yeah, my only my only little influence.